Uh, we've had quite a full day of classroom interactions, uh, breakout sessions, and, and research sharing from some of our uh, IMSA students with our distinguished guests. And uh, wow, distinguished they are, and they're doing such uh, cool field work that uh, even before we start the questions and answers, I've asked them to share a little bit about their, their field research uh, with Fred's actually starting in less than 24 hours uh, tomorrow in the, on the Mississippi River. Uh, so joining us today is Dr. Beth Shapiro. Uh, Dr. Shapiro is an evolutionary biologist who uses genomics to better understand the complex relationship between environment and the evolution of species. A pioneer in the young field called ancient DNA, Dr. Shapiro travels extensively in the Arctic collecting bones of long dead creatures, including mammoths, horses, and extinct giant bears. She uses DNA extracted from these remains, and she hopes to learn how environment drives evolution, why some species are more susceptible to others and to, to extinction. She's currently an associate professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California at Santa Cruz. She received her undergraduate degree in ecology from the University of Georgia in 1999 after spending her first quarter as uh, looking at broadcasting, I understand. <laughs> uh, she's got her PhD in zoology from Oxford University. She has been widely recognized for her research, including honors such as being selected as a MacArthur Fellow, a Packard Fellow, a Searle Scholar, a National Geographic Emerging Explorer, her scientific articles have appeared in such journals as Science, Nature, Molecular Biology, and Evolution. Uh, please welcome Dr. Beth Shapiro. And we would uh, also like to welcome Dr. Frederick Jansen. Uh, Dr. Jansen has been a professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology at Iowa State University since 1994. Before then, he was a, a graduate and a, uh, ran track at North Central College uh, just down the road in Naperville. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago and completed his postdoc work at University of California, Davis. In addition to teaching, mentoring, and outreach awards and recognition, he has received the Young Investigator Prize from the American Society of Naturalists. He has also authored more than 135 scientific publications since 1986, served on multiple editorial boards. He's conducted integrative biological research for over 25 years to connect processes working at the molecular level all the way to those operating globally and at timescales from the imminent future to the pre-dinosaur past. In particular, he has contributed to a broader understanding of ecological, evolutionary, and genetic concepts typically employing sex determination in reptiles as a model system. Uh, it is evident that we have two panelists who are truly a great minds, and let's welcome Dr. Jansen as well. And uh, before asking them to talk about their, their research, uh, I, I had the opportunity to spend some time over spring break in Singapore with three of my SIR students. And uh, one of the exhibits that we attended at the uh, uh, Gardens by the Bay in the, um, the, this eight-story, nine-story tall, uh, really, rainforest, it's, it was called the Cloud Forest Exhibit, was called uh, Five Degrees Centigrade. And you, you sat in these low seats and looked up at this giant screen, uh, even about the size of the IMSA Titans over there, maybe a little wider. And, uh, what it did on the screen is it showed what happened uh, to various ecosystems in the Earth for every uh, two-tenths of a, a degree centigrade that the uh, climate warmed. And uh, the disastrous effects of every two-tenths of a degree up to five degrees centigrade and what would happen to uh, uh, talk about extinction of species and life on the planet and how serious it is. So as we, we talk about um, evolution, we think about these large-scale changes, yet I think we're in a time when we uh, almost need to think uh, on a more shorter term because this uh, climate change can drastically impact uh, life on the planet in uh, truly a matter of, of decades. So uh, I think we're going to learn a lot today 
and it uh, really connects the past, the present, and as I, as I said a moment ago, the imminent future. So it is an honor, again, to welcome these two panelists who are doing work uh, with, with uh, animals, some extinct, uh, some not, but uh, their work will, in the words of our mission, advance the human condition. So, uh, Dr. Shapiro, would you uh, share with us a little bit about your research first? Is this on? Yes. Um, hi. Uh, I, I guess I, I grew up in a small town in North Georgia, and um, I've, I think I've been trying to get out of small towns since then, but I end up going to even smaller places in weird parts of the world, like Hatanga in North Central Siberia, and places like this. But uh, um, I'm really driven to do lots of different things, and I, I really like that I found a job where I can do pretty much whatever I want, and where I can change my mind a lot and go do something else. Um, I'm mostly interested in evolution and ecology and how animals and plants respond to climate change. And my work in ancient DNA addresses this by, instead of looking at populations today that are distributed around the world and asking, how did they get this way? And making educated guesses about what might happen in the face of current climate change, I actually go back into the past. And we get DNA sequences from bones and tissue and hair and teeth from animals that survived the last ice age or did not and use this information to try to learn how animals and populations and species responded to past periods of climate change. And in doing so, we hope to come up with some scientific basis for making decisions about conservation and management of species that are under threat due to climate change today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> I have an opportunity to follow that. Uh, it's <laughs> shortens what I was going to say because a lot of the same motivations are, are similar. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of career where uh, it, it, it motivates me in the same sense of being able to pursue questions about how the world works, uh, how the world has worked, how it might work uh, in the future in ways that um, are sort of un, more or less under you know, my control. Uh, and that means makes it you know, more exciting and the places you go. Wait, I'm going to start to sound like Dr. Seuss. I better not do that. Um, but you know, you can, you, the kinds of uh, organisms one might study, the kinds of questions you ask, the places you can go uh, are um, uh, exhilarating and the kind of thing that, that gets me up every day. Uh, it's also a great opportunity for me to work with lots and lots of uh, students and colleagues from around the globe as well. Um, uh, I've I guess I would say with respect to my research that it just isn't fun for me if it doesn't involve lots of people. And so to that end, I, I usually have anywhere from eight to 10 high school students. Uh, right now I have 15 undergraduates as well, six graduate students and postdoc working in my lab. So I kind of have a, a, large, a small business or something. I guess, but um, the great thing about it is that it, it's, a, it's a real diverse group and a lot of the really fun and interesting questions that we've pursued in the past uh, and currently are generated by uh, the brains of all those, all those folks and the things that we do and, and a lot of the things that we, we try to do other groups can't accomplish, but we can because of uh, the teamwork side of things. So. My, my, my lab mostly works on reptiles now, but um, we also work on other long-lived organisms. I still have a long-term study on saguaro cactus in the desert southwest. So I suppose you could say I may be fascinated with things that live a long time and, uh, and sort of maybe challenging myself to figure out how they might continue to do the same in the future. Good. Well, thank you. We're going to take some questions. and. Um, so you, you can uh, please line up the microphone and ask questions. And while the first brave soul is coming down, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Fred a question. But uh, questions about anything to do with our research, uh, climate change, uh, evolution, evolutionary uh, biology. So uh, if you would step right up to the, the microphone. And um, so Fred, would you, would you just talk a little bit about your, your research with uh, turtles and what you're doing tomorrow, literally, in the Mississippi River? So one of the field sites uh, where we, so, so I guess I should say that uh, my lab's not only diverse in terms of uh, 
uh, the folks that are involved in it, but uh, the, the way in which I've constructed my research program, I guess I would say, is also diverse or maybe integrative is another word for it. Uh, so the kind of things that we do involve um, generally a mixture of field studies. Some of those are observational. We go out and see what things are doing, but some of them are manipulative where we, we change uh, aspects of, uh, say, the environment or so on um, to try to better understand what they're doing. Uh, we do the same sorts of things under lab conditions or control conditions. Uh, and we also do, uh, from molecular work and genomic work as well, uh, all the way to uh, actually a lot of computational work, so simulations and other kind of analytical work um, to sort of, uh, that are grounded in the biology that we, we do originally with our various studies uh, to then sort of be able to make predictions about whether that's uh, sort of the way something works or the way something will work. So we try to mix a whole bunch of, uh, I guess, approaches. We try to integrate them to get a, a fuller, a more solid understanding of a particular problem or an organism or a system. Go ahead. First question. My question is for uh, Dr. Shapiro, but Dr. Jans, feel free to chime in. Um, you talked about hybridization a lot in your uh, breakout session. How much has hybridization increased over the past couple of years, and how much has it been affected by global warming? So how much hybridization has increased, and how much has been affected by global warming? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bye, bye. Seriously, uh, we, we are only starting to understand how common hybridization has been in the past. We are only starting to understand how common hybridization is now. Um, if we look, we find hybrids now of lots of different species, and we think that it's happening more frequently now as ranges of animals that have, up until this point, that have been separated are now coming and overlapping with each other. But you have to remember that we're in an interglacial period right now, and this isn't the first interglacial period we've ever been in. Um, 20,000 years ago, it was an ice age. 125,000 years ago, it was hotter in the summers than it is today. And at that point, there were animals whose ranges would have overlapped, who again today are starting to overlap. We don't know how much that meant that they had hybridized then. What we can do is we can look now into the genomes of different species and we can ask whether they look like they have hybrid ancestry, whether there is infiltration of one genome into another. And the more people look, the more evidence they find that this has happened. And it may not be that hybridization is a disaster. It may instead be that hybridization is just another evolutionary process that helps to maintain diversity and allow different species to get genes that may provide some sort of advantage in a new environment. So hybridization may not only be a cause of climate change, but a way that some species species are able to adapt to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well. This question is also for Dr. Shapiro. During the previous session, you mentioned how like, there could be negative effects uh, due to hybridization of diluting like, the pure genomes and things like that. Um, but can you elaborate more on like, the potential benefits you see of hybridization? Sure. <clears throat> well. If there are uh, particular genes that provide some adaptive advantage to a species that lives in a, in a given environment, and then individuals move into that environment who don't have those adaptive genes, if they were to hybridize with each other, that gene might get passed into the other population and give them some selective advantage. Uh, one way that we can look at this is, um, I know I talked about Neanderthals and humans a lot, but there are two genes that we've found that look like they've come into the human population after hybridization with Neanderthals and have gone to high levels of um, frequency in human populations where they've come in. And the only way that this could happen is if those genes provide some selective advantage to humans. Um, one of them is an MHC gene. That's a, it has to do with immunity and selection. And it could be that we got some gene with immunity that, had, that provided some benefit against some disease from Neanderthals, and it was important, and it went to fixation or higher frequency in human populations. So that's one way that mixing can cause an increase in diversity that can help. Um, these things, I think, we'll start to see more and more frequently now that we have more genome data and more evidence of hybridization happening. But um, it's, a, it's an interesting and open question. 
lots of room for research. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to say, it sounds like a great SIR uh, project for next year. Go ahead. Looking for Neanderthal genes in humans. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I was just curious, uh, either one of you could answer this question. Uh, what ancient species uh, you think are the most significant in the work that you do? What ancient species are the most significant in the work that you do? Hmm. Well, I'll, I'll start, and then you can talk about ancient things, because there are some awesome ancient reptiles. But I, I think most significant is a hard question, but I do have some favorites. Um, one of my favorite an ancient extinct species is uh, the giant short-faced bear, Arctodus. If he were to stand up, he'd be about 15, 16 feet tall. We made him extinct. You can imagine why. Yeah. Um, and my other favorite extinct animal is the giant beaver. Um, it stood five feet tall, and it's one of my favorites because it's funny. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so maybe I could, my answer could potentially not be funny, because I was going to say one of my favorite extinct species is Lonesome George, which maybe isn't so funny since that species went extinct within the last year. Um, but it's nonetheless true, one of my favorite species, a Galapagos tortoise. Uh, I think that, um, uh, Again, my lab studies mostly turtles as our organisms of interest, and uh, certainly some of my favorites I'd love to have seen were um, some of the ancient uh, sea turtles that were uh, so, so remarkably large. They were you know, larger than a VW bug. I think those would have been some pretty phenomenal uh, animals to see. But in terms of their importance to my work, I guess I would be even keener to, to know about the fossil species that existed at the times when the different turtles evolved their different sex determining mechanisms. And those don't have names, but if I could go back in time, those would be the times I'd want to be at. I'd just like to say that was the second time the Volkswagen bug has been used in comparison to an extinct thing today in the last few hours, which <laughs> <laughs> for the giant armadillo that used to live in Florida. Oh, yeah. Right yeah. It's obviously quite a, an important standard of measurement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, guys. Who's next? Yes. Dr. Jansen piqued my interest on this question, but I'm sure Dr. Shapiro has some insight as well. Um, with the pressing significance of climate change, what kind of careers are starting to be spurred? And do you think those will be coming up with a focus on biological and ecological skills and training education, or on computer science and mathematical modeling? or even in engineering and business solutions to the effects of climate change? Yes. <laughs> yeah, really, literally all of those. And, and, and frankly, the way I train students in my lab now is uh, probably is different the last 15 years than it was the first five. And it's specifically for that reason is to train students who are interdisciplinary and have, uh, in particular, quantitative talents. Um, beyond those that are maybe more, say, biological and, and, and chemical and physical. Um, and I think it's because a lot of the challenges that we're going to face, they don't even have to do with climate change, but that they're maybe interesting for us from the perspective uh, as biologists, require people that are exposed to and have meaningful exposure to uh, different fields. So I think, and, and, and well, I'll let Dr. Shapiro maybe expand on this, but I, I certainly find that in some of the questions we do, including this recent paper we are just published on the, the painter turtle genome, uh, it, it brought together a variety of different people with all sorts of experience, and there's no possible way a single person or even a handful could have had that. So it's going to be teams, I think, too. Yeah, sure. I, I can say that um, in science, uh, as far as careers in science, I think science as a whole is becoming more integrated, cross-disciplinary. I mean, we certainly have collaborators who are in industry, collaborators who are you know, involved in bioengineering and bio biotechnologies involving with genome sequencing and assembly. 
Um, genome assembly is a hard problem. These are all computational things. Um, but we also work with mathematicians and statisticians and geneticists and paleontologists and people whose job it is to fly in helicopters and dart polar bears. And, you know, it's, a, it's increasingly global and increasingly um, collaborative. And I like that. It actually makes the job more fun. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is for Dr. Jansen, because I had his breakout session. Um, so in the breakout session, someone asked about sea turtles and how they would be affected by a TSD. What about tortoises? Ah, so the question, so for those who weren't at my presentation, shame on you, no. <laughs> um, uh, but I talked about uh, turtle species that have a trait called temperature dependent sex determination, and that's essentially the case that uh, the sex of the babies is determined by the temperature they experience during a discrete period of embryonic development, and then it's permanently determined thereafter. And um, one of the questions I received afterward had to do with, uh, you know, w whether I thought sea turtles uh, might be susceptible to uh, climate change um, compared to the painter turtles that I was talking about, the freshwater species. Uh, and now we're talking about tortoises, which is a terrestrial group. Uh, and I would, I would say that, um, in contrast to the sea turtles, I think the tortoises are much more likely to be in trouble. Uh, and that's also because uh, most of them are tropical, or I, let me, I guess they tend not to have a, a geographic distributions that make them farther from the equator, more temperate. Uh, and that also is related to the fact that their thermal tolerance windows are narrower. In other words, it doesn't take as much of a change in the thermal environment to affect them negatively as it does a species this far north. Uh, so I, I would say that probably tortoises are going to be in worse shape. But I would also say, with the exception of the desert tortoise in the United States, there is almost, I don't know of anybody else uh, on the globe who's studying sex determination in tortoises. So there's a great project, <laughs> or 30. Thank you. Um, well, this is directed towards you, Dr. Jensen, but um, I was just wondering, I know in your presentation you mentioned that it's possible to freeze a turtle, and I was wondering exactly how that worked. Yeah, the, the question is about, that's what, yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Jensen, I talked a little bit about this at lunch, too, about the idea of freezing turtles. Yeah, so, so so one of the species that my lab primarily works with is the painted turtle, and they have an unusual aspect of their biology. Uh, the babies hatch out of the eggs at the end of embryonic development, just like every other turtle species does. Uh, but then the babies stay in the nest over the winter. Um, and these nests are maybe five to 10 centimeters, two to four inches below the surface of the soil. And uh, I, you can imagine what it's like two to four inches below the soil outside here. It's very cold. And so we've done some experiments under lab conditions where we've been able to freeze these painted turtle babies uh, for as long as a couple of days and thaw them back out again, turn them into a little, in the same kind of temperatures, we'd be human popsicles. Uh, and they, they thaw out and they, they are fine to, our, to what we can, as far as we can tell. Um, so what we need to understand is, you know, how they do this out in the wild, and that's partly why tomorrow I'm going to the, my turtle camp field site uh, over on the Mississippi River on the way back to Iowa to excavate 11 nests that we've left in the ground from last June. To, uh, we had temperature loggers in them and everything to see if these turtles froze and if they survived it in the wild. And uh, if we show that they do, the next step is to understand biochemically how they do this, and then the next step after that is to commercialize it. Okay, thank you. Wait, wait. What are you going to commercialize? Turtle pops? <laughs> really? <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So I was just wondering, uh, what kind of cool places has your research taken you? And what cool places do you think you might end up going as a result of your research? Cool as in cold or cool as in awesome? Cool as in awesome. Because <laughs> I can answer the first one. Cool as in cold. I've been to all of the crappiest towns in Russia. <laughs> Those are also pretty awesome, but uh, also just kind of horrible. Um, uh, 
I, I, the coolest place that I'm going is anywhere that I haven't been yet, and um, I think that's probably pretty honest. I, <laughs> I will happily take on crazy new research projects that have nothing to do with anything that I'm doing at the moment if it means I get to go somewhere that's very cool, as an awesome. Um, How about your Panama? How that kind of changed your thinking and got you going to where you're going? To your experience? Well, actually, my the what changed me from my career trajectory in broadcast journalism to becoming a scientist was a class that I took during the freshman year, during my freshman year at University of Georgia. We, it was a geology and ecology and archaeology class, and we started off on the east coast of Georgia. We learned about the seaside processes and learned about the geology of the, that part of the world. And then we got in some vans and we drove across the country. And for nine weeks, we slept in national parks and we climbed up things and we hiked down things and we jumped over things. And only one time did we have to be rescued from a crevasse by a helicopter on Mount St. Helens. Only once. <laughs> Um, but it was nine weeks, and it was incredible. It was a, a, a at the risk of sounding completely corny, a, a life-changing experience. I decided that it would be something, it would be great if I could come up with a, a career trajectory where I got to be outside and go and do different things and actually use that to, to learn about how the world works and, and, and geology and paleontology and stuff. So much so that I'm actually developing a new class right now for the University of California, Santa Cruz, where I'm gonna take undergraduates up to the Arctic, which is my current field sites. We're gonna fly into Fairbanks and rent some vans and drive around the Arctic, looking at Arctic ecology and Arctic processes and do some gold mining in the Yukon and collect mammoth bones and tusks and things like that and, and learn about the geology and human history and ecology of the Arctic in relation to climate change, so um, nice. that's a cool place to have been. You've been to some pretty awesome places. Yeah, so I'll have to confirm that I had a fairly analogous experience. Um, uh, at the time I found what I wanted to do for my career, I was uh, basically pre-med at that point, trying to fulfill my biology degree and took a three-week field course that went to Arizona and New Mexico so we drove from Chicago <laughs> to Arizona, New Mexico, and camped in the desert. And it was more or less during that particular period where I had the epiphany while we were measuring arroyos and cactus and things like that, that it, I, I, I mean, you, you could get paid to do this? I mean, I mean, I can figure out questions about nature, and someone will pay me to figure them out, and I get to come up with those questions? Yeah, it, was, it was an easy sell for me. Um, and it also got me to lots of cool places, as I'll confirm, and a lot of motivation for the organisms I study is that, unlike Dr. Shapiro, they tend to be farther from the poles and closer to the equator. So I spent a lot of time in uh, Galapagos and mainland Ecuador and Costa Rica as well, um, and, and East Africa for, for some of that work, um, although most of what I do now is in, in North America, but I do, uh, like, like her, uh, take undergraduate classes to these places, including, again, Galapagos, Costa Rica, the desert southwest. In fact, we'll be going back next spring to visit my cactus research sites um, in Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, which will be year 30 of that long-term study. So, so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great career. You don't get paid a lot, though. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I would like to ask a question uh, to both of you. Um, where do you see, uh, like, where do you see your future projects going? What are some of your current interests, and what do you think? What are your current hypotheses on those projects? That's a very big, open question. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of projects going on in my lab, um, mostly involving how climate change has affected populations in the past. I think that the most the most notable changes in the last couple of years and the direction that things are going is away from looking at little tiny fragments of DNA and using genomics, so looking at complete genomes to try to address these same questions. And this just means that the power of the scientific approach is a lot higher to be able to really understand the strength of natural selection on different populations, to pinpoint what 
things, whether it's climate change or the first appearance of humans in North America, are actually driving some of these large-scale changes to the ecosystem and to the community. And uh, the price for sequencing and the amount of time, person time, it takes to generate as much DNA data that we, as we have now is, is the price is dropping and the time it takes is dropping. And this is good news because it means that we're, we're, we're in a a genomics revolution, I've heard said, and it's really changing the face of all the research that we're doing. And I would add to that uh, that what, at least what I feel like is that a lot of the big questions in our field are relatively similar to what they used to be, but a lot of them we can now tackle with technological advances that weren't possible. So we're getting insights to those questions in ways it just weren't possible. So this may be strange to you, but, but the genomic advances, uh, frankly, global positioning systems and their improvement, um, other kinds of technologies, even the, the kind that you see with cell phones and the apps that we have and the, the stuff we can measure um, you know, non-destructively and remotely and all the computational power, uh, all those advances don't change the conceptual science that we do, but they do give, I think, more satisfying answers. And so I guess I would say that maybe for my field too, or my particular research that we're doing in my lab, it's not so much that the questions are changing, but the way that we tackle them is. And for us, we're also leveraging nature's experiments. So instead of just studying the painted turtles at turtle camp nearby in the Mississippi River, we're asking, and we can now because of technological changes, how they're, how they're solving these problems of current climate change in places all throughout the United States right now that have different climates. So it's the same kinds of questions, but getting at them by sort of leveraging technology okay. for me. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, David? Um, so this question is going to apply a bit more to um, society in general. Um, I read somewhere that the percentage of people in America who don't believe in evolution is somewhere around 46%. I don't know if this is the most recent data. I don't know if it's the most accurate, but even as given a slight amount of error, that's a, quite a large number. I feel, and because, I think it's because I, say, I think most Americans don't actually read the scientific journals, and even fewer of them go into the, the part where they actually study and try and look at the evidence directly themselves, as you have. Um, so my question is this, um, what can those of us who are interested in science but not in the field of biology, what can we do to foster this kind of, kind of thinking in our society? Oh, man. Right, so, uh, go ahead, did you hear the question? Oh, uh, yeah. That's a powerful question, yeah. It's, it's, it, it's such a conundrum. It's tough, and a lot of my experience is one of the great things about the, the turtle camp site is that that there are folks on a daily basis that are at that site and they're asking us what we're doing and the students learn how to communicate our complex science uh, to people who aren't scientists. Uh, and when we, we get pushback on questions about evolution and about climate change and so on. And I suppose one of the things I've learned through the years is that, um, gosh, I hope this doesn't sound bad, but that data don't matter. That that most of the folks are impervious to, to facts, that facts is not, aren't, aren't going to convince them. Uh, I think what, what, what is more like, okay, this is just, again, simply my opinion and observations, and I may be wrong. Um, I would guess that uh, at the stage that, that you guys are at, um, where you're learning and, and you are still able to put together facts to construct um, a truth, if you will, that the best role you can have is to use, I think, the sort of social approaches that lead most people to generating their long-term beliefs and knowledge to help create a more logical um, culture. I'm sorry, I gotta stop talking. It's a, it's a, it's a hard question, I, I'll, and I'll take a, a stab at maybe going to round the way answer. Um, I've found that scientists in general are not very good communicators, and this doesn't help our plight at all, and that scientists learning to communicate 
without being rude and dismissive, I think is important because as soon as people feel like uh, they're being ignored or their beliefs, even though we feel very strongly in the other direction, are being dismissed as just completely ridiculous or that they're an idiot if they believe that way, they just get their back up and they don't want to pay attention to anything. And learning how to be an effective communicator is actually a very hard skill and it's something that most scientists, lab bench scientists, are terrible at. You know, we, we don't have any formal training in any of the things that we're actually expected to do to make money. We're supposed to teach, supervise students <laughs> and communicate, and we have no formal education in any of these things. <laughs> Um, so one of the, some of the stuff that we're doing is through my involvement with National Geographic, for example, what we're trying to do is increase uh, global participation in science experiments using social media. So we're doing a lot of things where we're uh, putting stuff up on Nat Geo's website and we're asking for people to do things like look at a GPS coordinate and tell us what you see on Google Maps and get people actually actively involved in generating the data themselves that we then use to address questions and to show that things have changed over long periods of time and, and kind of get it in there but make them be part of that discovery process. And I realize that to some extent that's preaching to the choir. I mean, people who are looking at National Geographic's website are probably more prone to believe in evolution anyway. But by increasing the reach of... Uh, scientists that are effective communicators and the reach of science within the public more broadly, I think we can make progress. It's going to be slow. It's a hard job. But I think we, we can... We can do something to help these numbers. <laughs> um, just a little addition, where can I find the information on this project you were speaking of? This just National look at Geographic? National Geographic's website. Yeah, All there's right, a bunch you. of stuff. If you look under Explorers, there's one project right now that's pretty cool where uh, a friend of mine who's also an explorer is looking for the tomb of Genghis Khan. And this is kind of a, a weird thing to do because there's a oral tradition that if you find the tomb of Genghis Khan, you'll cause the end of the world. And I asked him if he, you know, he felt a little bit of a of societal guilt about really trying to bring about the end of the world, but he hasn't come up with a satisfactory answer to that, if you ask me. Um, but he's looking at, he's, he's, he has this project where he's, he's mapped out the world and individuals log onto the website and they look at a particular coordinate that, G, that the Google Earth is putting down and they say, is there something weird there? And if enough people, so the key here is that People might look at something and find something weird and click yes, but this is being done millions and millions of times. So if enough people hit yes to a particular location, they think, oh, there must be something there. And they go and they look to see what it is that they've found. And they've gone three times now and twice they've found sheep. <laughs> And once they found some actual archaeological stuff where they were actually able to see that there was something neat that was buried underground and bring it up. But it wasn't Genghis Khan's, Genghis Khan's tomb, but it was still archaeological stuff that hadn't been discovered, but that you could see from these satellite images of Google Earth. But there are a couple of these, uh, these projects that you can find out on National Geographic's website. I'll give a plug for another one called Project NOAA. Look that one up. It's pretty cool. It has to do with taking pictures of different species and organisms and generating this big catalog of freeware images for everyone from around the globe. Um, and everybody who has a cell phone can participate in that. And there's a bunch of things like that. So have a look at National Geographic's website. It's cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good. And uh, I just read a, a book, David, and, and now the result from our IRC over vacation called uh, Baseball in the Garden of Eden. And uh, it actually, I mean, silly as it sounds, talked about that same kind of question where the, the creation myth was Abner Doubleday invented baseball, and there's this whole series of data that takes it way back into the 1400s, an English game, and that it wasn't an American game at all, but it doesn't make Abner Doubleday any less a, of a hero in American culture. And I, uh, We walk throughout the campus, and we see creation myths of, of different cultures around. And so I think uh, part of the issue is not making it a, a divisive, but, but, but how can you accept a creation myth and still have evolutionary fact? And uh, especially in this country sometimes, I think we get so entrenched in carving out positions versus seeking first to understand others and then uh, to be understood is important. So that's my answer to that question, even though you didn't ask me. But uh, next question. Oh, I'm like actually the appropriate height for this microphone. That's very cool. 
Okay, Dr. Shapiro, your comment about scientists and communication was actually a great segue into my question, which uh, is more to do with generally working in a global context. Both of you work in global contexts and work with many different people of many different backgrounds and languages. And uh, what communication challenges have you faced in that context and what tools have you used to uh, overcome them? Um, working in Russia is very hard for me. I tried on several occasions to learn to speak Russian. Uh, I took night school and I went to six classes and they all were a bunch of us sitting around and the teacher pointing at us and going, ugh, and us going, ugh, and her going, niet. <laughs> <laughs> and I missed like two classes and when I came back they were declining nouns and I was just like, you know. <laughs> so the extent of my Russian consists of tent, mosquito, lake, vodka, you know, <laughs> all the important things for working with Russians in the field. Um, communication is a, is, a, is a challenge and it is a problem. I, I was saying earlier, I, I, I did a lot of work in South America and Central America and at one point I was asked to give a seminar in Spanish. It was a 50 minute seminar and I did it, but it gave me very much respect for all of my colleagues who speak English as a second language who come to international conferences and always have to speak and write in English. It's a very hard thing to do, but the language of science is very much English and a lot of the jargon that we use is English anyway and so I think we're at a significant advantage compared to, compared to our, uh, many of our colleagues, um, which is you know, unfair but the way it is. You have comment or? All right, thank you so much. Um, you two both have very distinct backgrounds. I mean, you look at stuff that's been dead for a while and you look at stuff that's been, uh, that's alive now. So I was wondering based on your, huh? Frozen. But frozen, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but I was wondering how your two, how your different perspectives, what you thought based on those, um, how our current client, climate change is going to affect. I know you said you've seen stuff like this in the past, but based on what you've seen, how do you think current species are going to adapt and evolve to overcome, meet, or die because of those challenges? Right. I'll start from the historic and then, so I was saying to someone earlier, we were talking about this, that um, in my work in the Arctic, what we've found is that during ice ages, there is a community of cold adapted animals that tend to do very well, and the warm adapted animals don't do very well. The cold adapted animals include mammoth and woolly rhino and bison and horses and, and caribou and things like this. And the warm adapted fauna include giant sloths and mastodon and um, you know the short some of the bear species, etc. Actually, brown bears do better when it's cold. But there are different communities of megafauna that were alive during warm periods and cold periods. And our research has shown that throughout the Pleistocene, that's the last million or so years, we've had an oscillation between warm interglacial periods and cold glacial periods. And during the cold times, the cold adapted fauna do well, and during the warm times, the cold adapted fauna are suppressed. They go into refugial sites where they can survive, and then they come back again during the cold times. And we've seen this oscillation where it gets cold, and then it gets warm again. It gets cold, and then it gets warm again. The populations do well or do poorly depending on how well they're adapted. And this happens over and over and over again until this last oscillation when everything goes extinct. So why is that? What's the difference between this most recent oscillation and everything in the past? It's us, right? We're around now and we are changing not necessarily just the climate but also the land use. So there may have in past been these refugial areas that were connected by corridors where these animals could maintain large enough populations to be reproductively viable. But now that we're here farming and building roads and cities, these don't exist anymore. And maybe we weren't building roads and cities 10,000 years ago, but we were certainly changing the landscape. We were changing the fire regime. We were introducing agriculture. We were hunting things and we hadn't been before. And I have no doubt that anthropogenic causes are responsible for the Pleistocene mass extinction, even though the animals that went extinct were already on the decline because of climate change. Natural climate change, climate change today is natural, 
but it's faster because of humans and what we're doing to the landscape. So, you know, there are, there are problems and they're our fault, but um, we are part of this natural process. You know, we, we are another species who lives here and we have changed the environment to suit our needs. Fortunately, we're also the first and only species that have a good enough brain to be able to think about the consequences of our actions and turn some of them around. And I think that's where we are today. And it would be great to think and be optimistic that we will do that too. <laughs> but uh, that's the extent of my comments on that. But uh, uh, most of the animals, the turtles that I work with uh, have a, as you can probably guess, a very rich fossil record and uh, they're very distinct in the fossil record and it's, fortunately it makes it difficult to confuse them with anything else. And so the good news about that is we have a, a fairly good view of what was around and when. Um, and what's interesting is that when you look back at these, in particular if we think about uh, the, the last sets of um, ice ages and, and, and those fluctuations, um, we don't seem to see much of anything in the way of uh, extinctions of turtle taxa um, as a consequence or that can be really le legitimately linked to these changes, whether they were warming or cooling. Um, but, but what we all are seeing now is that the rate at which these changes uh, of current climate changes are occurring is, such, is so fast that I don't think we could have that same level uh, of confidence that we did historically that uh, these animals can necessarily weather these, these climate changes. Um, and I would add that uh, with the turtles um, that have this temperature dependent sex determination, and it is true that most species of turtles uh, have that, but there are, uh, that we know of, uh, six times within the turtle tree of life where sex chromosomes have evolved. And, when, and we can take this fossil record and kind of go back on this turtle uh, tree of life and get a rough sense of approximately when those changes from temperature dependent to sort of sex chromosomes have occurred. And uh, all six times uh, that that seems to have occurred, uh, it's during a time of global cooling. Not one of them has been linked to a time when the globe's been warming. So that doesn't bode well. All right, thank you. Okay, so based on past um, patterns, when w if the if humans weren't a factor, when would the next cooling period be? And do you think that could have an effect on the rate of climate change, at least temporarily? I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that. I, I think there's, I mean, there's been a lot of research that has to do with the periodicity of these global warming and cooling periods. There's something around 150 to uh, 200,000 years. It's not precise. We don't really know precisely when these things happen or even what triggers them. Uh, it has something to do with the oscillation of the Earth around the sun as well as the tilt along its axis. But it's only been the last two million years where we've had these oscillations between um, warm and cool periods. Prior to that, it was hot. Um, and so, I mean, Earth history for the last, you know, three and a half, five billion years has been really, really different. And a lot of things cause variations. I mean, we've had periods of time when the atmosphere wasn't as rich in oxygen as it is now. And that drives other processes. And it's all a giant feedback loop that's not particularly well understood, but which there's a lot of research going into this right now. So I, I can't answer that question with any sort of precision, but it's a, it's a, it is a good question. And thinking about how, you know, do we have a certain amount of time to wait? If we can just last that long, will it switch back into an ice age and we'll all be okay? Yeah, that's, yeah, probably not. <laughs> So uh, the both of you have been very successful. You run your own labs. You get to go on fun research experiments all over the world. Do you have a, like a secret to your success that you could give to all the students here? A secret to your success. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go on. Uh, I guess I'll give a two-part answer. One is to, I think that. It's sort of what you're asking. And, and the first part of it is that I, I think of my, myself um, and my sort of experience uh, largely to the point of even getting into graduate school. Uh, I think of myself as like the ball in a pinball machine. 
And the people working the levers as being really kind mentors who knew what they were doing. And every time I got down and was just about to flush out of the system, they whacked me back up and scored me some points, you know, as I continued to accumulate. Um, so that's it may be a poor analogy, but I guess what I'm saying is that at some level, I, I think a lot of it's random, and it wasn't so much under my control, but that the course uh, of my experience and then career has a lot to do with other people caring about me and, and steering me in what they felt were the right directions. Um, and so the second part of my answer, I guess, is then, I mean, I had to do my part too, which was, uh, you know, believe in, in them and work my rear end off, sort of have a, a good work ethic, and that's, I guess, that's my answer. I, can add, I mean, I, I kind of agree that there's a randomness and also there's a nice thing to say about the people who support you and who are around you, but also I think one thing that's helped me is I, every time an opportunity came to me uh, that I evaluated and thought, wow, that's probably a really terrible idea. I pretty much went ahead and did it anyway. Um, don't be afraid to take risks. The only way that you can make some discovery that's not incremental is if you do something that's probably going to fail. And um, unfortunately, it's very hard to get funding to do that because nobody wants to spend taxpayers' money to do something that has a high chance of failing. But the only way that we can do something that really makes a difference is if we go out there and try it. I mean, who would have thought you could get a genome out of a bone that you recover from the dirt in the soil, right? Um, but we can, and the evolutionary insights that you can get from something that's 50,000 years old are incredible. But who knew? You know? So don't be afraid to take risks and jump at opportunities. Thank you. I would like to point out how great a segue that is, because my question is addressed to you again, Dr. Shapiro, and you might chime in on this as well if you've had an experience. You talked about how you were um, extracting DNA. I was wondering how that process works, and you even talked about de-extinction for some animals, and if you could describe how that would work as well. <laughs> well, extracting DNA is a whole lot easier than bringing an animal from, that's extinct back to life. Yeah. <laughs> in that one is possible and the other is not. <laughs> um, uh, so how do you extract DNA? Well, uh, one of the interesting things about ancient DNA is that we don't actually know where the DNA is preserved. Um, we thought for a long time that it might have been in the marrow of bones, but it's not. It's actually in the bone matrix themselves. But when we think about bone, it's probably just like a sponge that's absorbing all sorts of DNA. So if I were to get a bit of mammoth bone and drill a bit of bone powder out of that, and then digest it away with a couple of different enzymes, and you can extract DNA. You can actually do it with pineapple juice and some soap. Um, I don't know if you guys have done that lab in your biology class where you extract your own DNA from your cheek swabs with some pineapple juice, but it's kind of fun and amusing. We do it with, you know, little kids, street fairs sometimes. Um, it's pretty straightforward to do. But when you extract DNA from a mammoth bone, you get maybe half mammoth DNA, and the other half is DNA from stuff that got into that bone while it was sitting in the ground. So bacteria and plants and fungi and stuff like that, and even my own DNA from breathing on it or touching it or whatever. And so one of the tricks to ancient DNA is to identify from that soup of all sorts of different types of DNA what really is mammoth and what is everything else, because it's confusing. You want to assemble a whole genome from broken down bits of DNA that's not just mammoth DNA, but mammoth and plant, bacteria and meat, etc. So it's not that easy to do. Bringing an extinct species back to life now. I don't even really know where to begin with this one. Um, why don't you invite me back and I'll give another hour seminar on it. <laughs> um, this, uh, the idea comes from um, Jurassic Park, I assume. Um, <laughs> Um, but actually, Jurassic Park, as a, as a movie, was, 
was an idea that was uh, spawned by ancient DNA, my field. And there's actually a, a dedication to Svante Pabo, who is l largely considered to be the, the father of ancient DNA. In the beginning of Michael Crichton's book, he acknowledges him and the evolution of this field and coming up with the idea for Jurassic Park. Those of you who are worried that you might wake up to a velociraptor knocking on your window, don't. Um, DNA survives at the most, you know, five, six, seven hundred thousand years. Dinosaurs are 65 million years old, and the bones are rock. You can't get DNA from rock, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, now, bringing something back to life that is recently extinct could be easier. Um, it's still not possible. We still don't have any intact cells from anything that's already dead. And the only way that we know how to bring things back is if we have intact cells. We could try to sequence the whole genome and piece it together by hand. We can't do that yet. Um, does anybody know how many vertebrate genomes are completely sequenced as of today? Vertebrates? How many different species of vertebrate genomes? Do you know how many? Can you guess? A couple hundred? Zero is the answer. <laughs> I tricked him, you know. <laughs> We, we know for the human genome has been the most sequenced of anything, and we know pretty much all of the part of our genome that's called the euchromatin. That's where the genes live. Um, but there's a whole part of our genome, makes it about 8 to 10 percent of our genome, called heterochromatin, and it's just a bunch of really tightly condensed repeat motifs, and we just can't sequence through it. We have no idea what's in there. It might not even be important at all, but it probably has to do with gene expression, has to do with the way chromosomes are wrapped up and actually learn how to do stuff. We don't know what that sequence is. We can't reconstitute it. And if we can't sequence it and reconstitute it, then we can't make a genome from scratch from a vertebrate yet, um, something we don't know how to do. That's a big leap of faith. Then, once we have a genome, which we can't put together, we have to be able to turn it on, make it act like a genome. We don't know how to do that. Then, once we have that, we'd have to be able to put it in some sort of host to be able to make it grow. We don't know how to do that. Um, then that host would have to make the thing that was inside it, this fetus, develop into the extinct animal without having its own genome determine the expression of that particular animal's gene. So if you put a mammoth baby inside an elephant, their genomes are nearly identical. And the mother's genome is actually going to be expressing hormones to determine how much gene expression is going to be going on in fetal development, not the fetus's genome, remember, which is almost identical as the, the elephant. So we don't really know how to do that either. And then we have to make it come to term and successfully survive, which we don't know how to do. And then we have to put it into an environment where it will actually be able to survive and reproduce and go about being a mammoth. And where would we do that? And should we do that? And what other ethical and technical hurdles do we have before we can bring something that's extinct back to life? Set. <laughs> that was complete. But I will say, if we're talking about Michael Crichton, my big complaint was that in the book and in the movie, they used amphibian DNA to fill out the dinosaur genome that they were using, which was extremely irritating given that amphibians and dinosaurs share a common ancestor about half a billion years ago. And, and they should have used alligator DNA, which would have been a much more recent ans common ancestor, and the alligator would have had temperature-dependent sex determination, so they wouldn't have had to do the fancy genetic stuff to make stop males and females, right? Which was the whole problem in the movie. I do not think dinosaurs had temperature-dependent sex determination because they're more closely related to, to the birds and the crocodilians, and there are no birds with uh, temperature-dependent sex determination. So that's just a guess, parsimony. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, both of you have researched um, like in depth into animal genomes or various animals, um, but is there anything that you found that is applicable to human genome? Sorry, ask the question yeah. again. Okay. Um, is there anything that you found um, while researching animal genomes that is applicable to human genome? Everything. Oh. 
Well, I mean, is there We're just another change? animal, aren't we? I mean, uh, we like to think of ourselves as something that's better than everything else, but we have genomes that evolve, that change, that react to the environment. We actually have genomes that are almost completely depauperate of genetic variation compared to other animals. We are, we are very not diverse as a species. Um, humans are a fantastic model species, though, for population genetics because there are so many of us that we've sequenced. So we actually can learn quite a lot about genetics and how genetics and evolution works in general by looking at the human. But I think we can extrapolate stuff that we learned about animal populations to how the human genome will evolve and behave as well. I mean, we learn about how genes are expressed in animals that we can manipulate. We can't manipulate humans very well. And we use animal models like mice and other things to learn specifically about human genetics because we can't do experiments on human babies, for example. Although I do experiments on mine. <laughs> Not genetic experiment. Well, I guess maybe being born is a kind of genetic experiment. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> oh, could you give an example maybe of something you found, like what you just said? of how um, you can use that to predict what will happen to our genome? Well, uh, we use um, mouse model organisms to learn what genes do. So we identify genes that a mouse has that is the same gene that we will find in our genome, but then in the mouse we can turn it off or increase its amplification or mutate it a little bit and learn how that affects the rest of the genome. And that will tell us about how the human genome is actually behaving because we can't turn off and on human genomes by human genes by changing things. So, okay. so. <laughs> Um, I was reading something. Wait, I was reading something on Yahoo. I think a couple weeks ago, something about how they brought back toads, like some in extinct toad uh, eggs, back from extinction um, because they were frozen and they found them. Um, my question was, is it? And I think you actually discussed this a little bit when answering Alonzo's question. But is it actually practical to? be trying to bring back extinct animals because they were extinct for a reason. <laughs> right, I'll start from the first one. I think you're talking about the Lazarus frog. Yes. This is a, a guy called Mike Archer who's in Australia and they've been working at this, uh, this really interesting frog. It's called the gastric brooding frog. It turns out that this particular frog changes the pH inside of its stomach and they actually swallow the eggs and grow them up and then kind of throw up live whole like adult frogs which is pretty freaking awesome. Um, <laughs> and uh, before they went extinct uh, they froze some of the eggs of this particular frog. I, I think it was cells, actually, that they did. And, and they didn't bring anything back, to extinction, back from extinction. What, they, what happened was they were able to make these cells divide in a plate. So they've gotten a little bit of the way. So they don't have a frog or an egg or anything like that. They have dividing cells, which is actually um, making it pretty far. The, the most successful attempt at bringing something back from extinction was a team of Spanish and French people who were working on something called the Bucardo in the northern part of Spain, Pyrenees. It was a goat-like animal that went extinct a few years ago. The last living animal was a female called Cecilia. She lived for six years by herself with the radio tag on. She, I imagine, was very lonely and depressed for that time period, but she was killed by a falling tree. And after she died, her eggs, which had been taken um, while she was still alive, when she was having the radio collar fitted, um, were um, grown up and implanted into some surrogate hosts. Uh, 57 females were attempted. I think it was 57. Don't quote me on the exact numbers here. Um, and they managed to get seven pregnancies to take place, and one of these came to term. And uh, Bucardo was born and lived for 18 minutes before dying of uh, lung failure. It turned out that it had had a lobe in its lung that was completely solid, like a piece of liver. And we don't really know why that it happens, but lung failure seems to be a common cause of death in cloned animals. Um, but this was the only successful de-extinction followed by re-extinction, I suppose. Um, the second part of your question, I, I think, is a very important thing to consider, and there are a lot of people who are interested in de-extinction who've, who've been thinking about the ethics of this. Certainly, if we don't know why something went extinct in the first place, we probably shouldn't bring it back until we've solved that. But there are so many other problems associated with bringing something back if they don't have a place to live. 
why are we doing it? Do we just want to look at it? Is that enough? Um, do we want to bring it back? I mean, you can imagine that a, one pro might be that if you have an ecosystem that is missing a particular organism that fills a specific niche, if you can bring back that organism and as a consequence save that entire ecosystem, then that is probably worth it in my mind if you could do that. We can't do it. I should keep reiterating that. We can't do this right now. We can't do it yet. Um, but if we're just bringing something back to look at it, I mean, what is that fair? What should we do? People bring up the question of the Neanderthal a lot, too, and I think there are harder questions there. I mean, this was a human, and certainly you would need informed consent to bring something back, but I would like to know if they could talk. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, there's, a, yeah, it's, there's, this is a big ethical conundrum, I would say, and, and I think it's really good. I mean, people are getting quite scared and, and offended by this. I did an hour-long um, call-in show on NPR last week about this, and most of the people who were calling in were just scared, just like, we can't do this, it's too scary, we're going to introduce diseases, and we're going to take away money from other science, and, and we're going to take away money from conservation efforts. The answer to that is, why? Why are we saying that? I mean, a lot of the skills, the technical hurdles we have to overcome, we're going to overcome if, with other research avenues. We're going to learn about cloning because we're interested in, you know, reconstituting human organisms or, or human organs, and, and interest in, interest in kind of learning about how diseases have affected populations. We're not saying take money away from conservation and put it into this. Why, why can't it just be an, another thing to do? But I don't think we should fear it either, because what we're doing now is we're having an open conversation about it, about what's good and about what's bad and about what's possible and about what's not before it's possible. And I think that is a much better way to do science than to do it behind closed doors. And this is going to happen because people think it's cool. <laughs> Sorry, that was a really long answer. <laughs> I, I don't know if I have a, so much a comment on the, on the de-extinction uh, aspect, um, but I do think that one of the ones that we'll be uh, maybe facing that's uh, more realistic or impending in a different way is uh, rewilding, and that is uh, bringing back um, ecological analogs of organisms that we as humans drove extinct in certain ecosystems. So that would, I think... Uh, is something even maybe more, in, or potentially more likely to happen and has at some level already in some areas of Texas. Um, yeah, oh, uh, and uh, I think uh, it's a kind of an intriguing idea, um, including they brought back uh, a, a Bolson's tortoise, which is uh, a tortoise that used to occur in a large part of the United States, and they are, are uh, reintroducing that one in areas that we can't tell you. Yeah. And just, just to end, end on that note, there's a, there's a guy that I've worked with a lot in northeastern Siberia called Sergei Zimov, who is making a habitat for mammoths for when we bring them back. And he's called it Pleistocene Park. And it's this big swathe of land in Siberia where he's reintroduced bison and wild horses and he's preparing the land for these things to come back and, and the one thing that he's doing that always sparks my interest the most is there's this hypothesis that like elephants, mammoths probably caused their own habitat to be regenerated by knocking things down and really causing that mammoth step to be built. So in order to prepare the habitat for the reintroduction of mammoths, he's bought some giant rolling things they use to make roads, you know, those big machines that my three-year-old loves. And he's driving around the permafrost on those things, knocking down trees, and causing the step hunter to come back in preparation for the mammoths when they come back. <laughs> so uh, that, that's fitting as the uh, Jurassic Park is about to be re-released at 20th anniversary. And, uh, and they're making Jurassic Park 4. Uh, that, that's right. But... Um, in all seriousness, the, uh, what we talk about in our belief statements, uh, creating connections is the essence of understanding. And uh, I appreciate how you've created these connections today between uh, history, philosophy, uh, science, climate change. At lunch we were talking, they were uh, both despairing about how much computer time they spend <laughs> in, in writing and mathematics. And, uh, but it all, it all fits together. And, uh, I always walk away with these um, humble. I, I've learned so much, but also inspired uh, by all the research opportunities. And my, my, my mind's going 90 miles an hour now thinking, uh, gosh, I wish I was uh, 
back sitting on those benches because the, the opportunities for research that will change the world is, is right here. And uh, I hope that um, 20 years from now on the 40th anniversary of Jurassic Park, uh, some of you are, are sitting up here talking about how your research has impacted uh, life on the planet and, and helped us uh, all to cope with the realities of, of climate change. So I want to thank our, our panelists for really a enlightening afternoon. That was, that was terrific. <laughs>